Hello and welcome to our session today. This is an introduction to open science. My name is Merle Massey. I am the coordinator for undergraduate research here at the University of Saskatchewan. And our special guest speaker today is Kevin Reed, who's an associate librarian uh, with, uh, with uh, the Murray Library, with the University of Saskatchewan Library. And uh, Kevin is the expert on open science and um, I had the privilege of watching him take a whole class through the concept of open science and, and work with those students uh, this past fall in Nutrition 230. And so Kevin knows all the ins and outs about open science, and I'm really looking forward to today's session. Thanks, Kevin, for joining us today. Thanks, Merle. Yeah, hi, everyone. It's nice that we have a relatively tight group today so we can talk about open science directly and how it might impact how you do research in the future. This project. This actual presentation is going to dovetail nicely with the research data management talk that was done last week, as well as the open access talk that you had on Tuesday. So if you haven't had a chance to check out those videos, please do, because this is almost an extension and a combination that brings everything full circle. So just to get started, what I wanted to introduce people to is the idea or ask you a question, which is what do you associate with the word open? And so I've actually created a Mentimeter page here. So if you can all go on your computers to menti.com and use the code 866-10765, I'd like you to enter in what do you associate when you hear the word open? So a little bit of a word association exercise here. Let's just take a minute to do that. And I'll drink water because it's excellent. Anything else people want to enter in? Available. Excellent. Okay, so flipping that then, what do you associate with the word closed? So a new page should have come up on unavailable, not shared, hey, well, excellent. Old school, oh, I love it, I love it. Okay, excellent. Thank you for sharing that. So all of those things definitely come to mind when I think about the difference between open and closed. And I actually like to depict it in an image. And so you can see here the body language of someone who was open versus someone who might have closed body language. And I really like to associate this with what open science and what open research is all about. So let's just keep that in mind as we go through this talk is that when we're talking about openness, we are really trying to make things available and open as much as we can. So the goal for today is to really help you to understand the difference between closed and open research approaches help you define what open science is, to outline how open science can fit into all of the different stages of the research lifecycle, to help you identify some current initiatives going on around open science to use as examples that might help you work through open science in your own research practices, and finally apply best practice in open science yourself. So the first thing that's important to think about when we think about open science is open science is really an umbrella term for a lot of different types of concepts. So open education, open data, having citizens do research and having it available to them, equitable access to research. And really what I'm talking about open science today, the focus is going to be on the idea of open research. So the word science is sort of the way this has been branded, but open research and the concepts of open science apply to all aspects of research, whether you work in humanities, all the way to working in medicine. So when we think about open science, we obviously have to think about the research lifecycle. And we've talked a little bit about this in the research data management course, but throughout the research lifecycle, we are producing a lot of content and we are thinking and sharing a lot of ideas with each other that actually may have benefit to other people. So in the idea stage, we're asking a research question, we're reviewing existing research and developing our hypothesis. With our methods, we're developing instruments, potentially we're developing an entire approach of how we're going to attack our research problem. We're then collecting information, we're synthesizing it in some way, we're analyzing it, we might be using different tools to do that, we might be using different resources to do that, and then finally we're making that information available. So maybe we're presenting at a conference, we're publishing in a journal, or we're publishing other types of research products. And the goal of open science or open research is how do we make every single aspect of our research process from the very beginning, the idea stage, all the way to us sharing our final results open and transparent and available. So that's really the wheelhouse in which I'm going to talk about open science today. So when we think about current research, I really like the idea of someone who put in old school. 
And at old school has been going on for a very, very long time. And this is really what the culture of research has started to do is closed research is entirely focused on that end product, that published article. That's what we receive rewards for. That's how we get tenure. That's how we get jobs by showing that we've provided some level of scholarly output as an impact of our research. And we know that from the publication, there's lots of great work being done in the background that might be synthesized in a publication, like the methods we took, how we collected information, and how we analyzed it. But still in closed research, the published article is the be all end all of that process. So when we think about it, and we can harken back to the talk on Tuesday, uh, where Didi talked about this idea of the iceberg, the publication is really just the tip of that iceberg, where all of the other work that we've done over the year or two years that we've done a recent completed a research project is hidden below the surface where we can't access it or necessarily even understand how it was done. And so I want to talk a little bit about why closed research is problematic. If we're only focusing on the publication, we're hiding key components of the research process. All of that work that we've done and all the documentation we've built over the course of a research project is hidden and inaccessible to other people. It also considers other products of research less valuable. Why is a survey instrument that I created that might be really helpful for analyzing a certain population, why is that not available to others? Why isn't that seen as valuable in the research process? It also makes reproducing or reusing research results very difficult because if we can't access how someone did all of the different steps it took to create that publication, how do we know that we can actually recreate those experiments or recreate the same process that an original researcher did. Obviously, it's going to restrict access to research. And finally, what it's doing is eliminating trust in research. If I can't see how you did what you did, how do I know that you've done it correctly and honestly? And this is what's really happening and causing a lot of issues in the research cycle right now. So again, if we think about closed research, the published articles would be all end all. We have no idea about all of those other steps in the concept and in the process of a research project. Similarly, because that process is hidden, again, it's not transparent, it doesn't receive any type of peer review. And again, we have that issue of trust and reliability. How do we know if we can't access any of this information that it was done in, in, in a, a good and reasonable and sound way? So I, I brought this slide up in the research data management class, but it definitely applies to open science as well. And this is the issue of reproducibility. So what we're seeing in a lot of different research projects is many publications that have resulted in, in high profile studies and new treatments and new drugs have essentially failed the test of reproducibility because they lack transparency. The people who actually tried to recreate the experiments couldn't in over 50% of psychology studies. And the other problem here is that the focus has always been on eye catching results. Journals have a publication bias because they only publish the highest profile, most interesting sort of gold standard type of research where we don't necessarily get a chance for a lot of other researchers who might create middling but results in the middle or even results that might fail to make that available as well, all of which has value to research and science in the future. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we go forward. And then if we think about it from a publishing model, so going back to Didi's talk on Tuesday, when we have a subscription-based model, what happens is that the government or someone funds a researcher to create the work, and then they submit it to a subscription journal, then only certain people can gain access to it. You may have noticed that libraries are having a much more difficult time gaining access to subscription journals because we have to pay exorbitant prices in order to do that. And what that means is that only a limited number of people can get access to this information, whereas the rest of the population who may not be able to afford it who doesn't have a library subscription through a university will never be able to gain access to it. And therefore research is stifled because of that. So when we think about that, not only are people not being able to access it, but we're only getting the publication on the surface of that information. It's creating a huge problem. And that problem has persisted for a very, very long time. So in order, and the reason it's been closed for so long is that really incentives right now, as I mentioned before, promote the publication above all else. Hiring tenure grants is all based on how much you've published, how well that's been cited, and that's really the, the gold standard for evaluating research. And in some cases, that's for good reason, but it also ignores all the other work that can be done. Also, in the, in the context of this, researchers are often pitted against each other competitively. So rather than keep things open and shared and available, researchers are taught to keep things close to their chest. 
and make sure that they don't share things because they might get scooped and then they might not get that publication that they need and they don't get credit for all of that work if someone else takes it and creates new results for it. Again, as I mentioned before, journals focused on the most eye-catching and high-profile studies. And something else I'll just say as someone who has been practicing open science personally for the past three or four years, is it's just harder to make all aspects of your research transparent because you have to think about it at every stage of the process. And you can't just create these kinds of content for yourself. You have to think about others in that process as well. So let's think about from that transitioning research to an open science model and what that looks like. So first of all, what is open science? What are we really talking about here? And again, this falls under the same umbrella as open research. And the goals are to make the products, which is the publication, the underlying data, and your methods of, of process for research of publicly funded research results, publicly accessible with no or minimal restriction. So if you pay taxes that pay for somebody to do research, you as a taxpayer and as a member of society should be able to access that information and be able to use it. Also, open science is designed to foster sharing and collaboration as early as possible in the research process. Open science is designed to get people to work together, not to hide things away from each other so that research can be done more quickly and can be done in a collaborative fashion with more minds. And then finally, it's really about creating systemic change to the way science and research is being done generally. So getting away from that closed model where publishers make a lot of money and research is slowed because of that. So there's a great article. I, I included the link in the references in the slide um, in this presentation from Watson in 2015. And, and he argues that when is open science just going to become science? Isn't science the practice of making everything in the discovery process fully open and available? and being transparent and driving discovery? Don't we want people to find the work that we're doing as we're doing it to create better work overall? So it's a really great article that sort of emphasizes why haven't we been doing this all along and why this is important. So again, when we think about open science, all of these type of things that I've talked about here, from your hypothesis to the instruments you build to the data, all of this is going to be made open in the open science process. So when we think about close research as that tip of the iceberg, open research drops that water down and opens up all of the other aspects of the work that you do and the products that you might create over the course of the research process. So your study protocols, software that you use, how you analyze your data, reference text that you may have used to work on your particular project and write your publication. All of that is inclusive of open science. So just a question for you all, we can just do this in the chat for now if we want to pause the presentation, is if for any of you who have started to do research or have thought about research, are there other types of outputs like the ones I've described that would help make your own research understandable? And do you think that these could benefit others beyond um, being embedded within a publication, but actually as standalone items? So just a curiosity in the chat, is there anything like that that you might have thought about that you could share. Context for what your research is doing is extremely important because it gives people a better picture of your entire process overall. Exactly. Thank you. So I just wanted to share with you my own research project and to show you that I'm also putting my money where my mouth is when it comes to open science. So I've just recently finished a project that looked at how researchers who are funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research have shared their data within their publications. And over the course of this research, I've had a study protocol. I used code to extract data about the publications from the PubMed database. I had raw data. I built a data collection instrument to pull the data out. I had an analysis plan and then the final data sets themselves. And my goal was to make all of this available, not at the end of my project, but as it, I was going, so as soon as I built the protocol, it was up online for people to see and I shared it. And then the same for every other piece of information. It's like, now this is up. So people can actually follow my progress openly online and it's all freely available to use. So just thinking about this and trying to make a case for why open science is beneficial. And I think the fact that you're even here um, speaks to the fact that you think it's, it's valuable and important is it's going to increase the quality, the integrity and the transparency of your research. The more you think about having to make every part of your research process discoverable to others, 
the harder you're going to work to make it strong and valuable because people are going to be able to see it. It's going to increase efficiency. The more the work you do up front, I find the faster I'm able to actually get the work done in reality. It's going to increase engagement with other types of research projects or products. As I was sharing my content, people were contacting me, giving feedback, asking if they could use parts of the information for something that they were doing at their own institution. So really seeing a sharing culture created in this opportunity. Again, it allows for peer review at all stages. So I actually want to receive feedback on what I'm doing, especially at the early stages. And I can receive that by the fact that I'm sharing my information ahead of time. I can also create stronger engagement with the public so I can think about ways to share my information, not only within academia, but with the people who it might actually affect in the real world. And then again, it increases collaboration opportunities, so new and faster research. So again, compared to that closed research process, all of this is transparent. It also opens up for review and comments and feedback and growth at every stage. And it also allows people to access the products of your research at every stage. So similarly, when it comes to publication, and I know Didi talked about this at length, when we publish in open access journals, what we're doing is making our research available to anybody. So not only people who have a license to subscribe and pay for a journal, anyone free of charge can access my research if I'm using open access. And we know that there's an advantage to this because, because people can actually access it, open access articles receive 18% more citations than the average subscription article because of the fact that people are accessing it more and can actually gain access to it regardless of where they live or their income level or anything like that. So when we put all of that together, not only do we have an open published article, but we have all of our methods and our instruments open and it's available to the most people possible. And that's really the ethos of what open science is all about. Is how can we make all of our research understandable and available to the most people possible so it can have a greater impact? So let's think about a little bit around what open science might look like in action. and Who's practicing open science? Uh, before I do that, I just wanna pause and see, are there any questions from people in the audience? I've kind of gone through this little stage of closed versus open, and I'm just wanted to pause here for a second, take a sip of water and see if anyone has any questions. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. I don't working, so I'm just gonna say it out loud. Sure. Um, I was wondering if you could speak on like any risks associated. You said like um, sometimes people aren't on board with open access because there's a risk of someone else swooping in and kind of stealing your stuff. So I was wondering if you could speak on a little bit more on that or like how to prevent it when you're using open access. Yes, so that, that's a great question. So and open access and open science are, are different, just to give some clarification there. So open access is about the publication itself alone. And by making something open access, it means your publication is freely accessible to anyone. Open science is all of the other pieces that created your publication. And so what I will talk about a little bit later is there are platforms that you can use to share your research products that people have to cite to use. And what we are seeing now is that people and tenure committees are changing the ways that uh, this is recognized. So if you build an instrument that somebody else uses, they would have to cite it and that would be seen as you contributing to the scholarly landscape in the literature. So th there's, the risks are mostly around that still because there are still people who are focused on the idea that research is closed and it's competitive and it, science and research does have to change in some way. But in general, the more people who practice this, the more it's going to become accepted and the more we're seeing that transition, especially at higher ups in terms of this work being recognized. For example, in my own tenure process, other research outputs like building a data management plan or sharing my instruments and showing how it's being used by others is seen as valuable and meeting the standards for tenure going forward. So it's about opening your research, but also making sure that you get credit for the hard work that you've done. And I'm gonna talk about how to do that. That's a wonderful question. Yes, absolutely. So the, the next question was around, have I noticed improvements around the open research paradigm? I have, and I think the, the main reason, main ways I've seen improvement is because of releasing some of my research originally, uh, before I even started the process, I had done so because I was looking for other collaborators who were interested or who were experts in my field. And because of it, I, because I was able to share that, I had three people contact me who became authors 
on the final publication later because of that. The other thing is that I think for me, and with open research more broadly, you, you do have to open yourself up a little bit. And so I also released my information with the purpose of wanting to get feedback from my peers. So I put myself out there and I got great feedback back because of it. And it improved my data collection instruments, how I was analyzing my data in the later phases. And because of that, it's really been, for me, a really valuable exercise, but you have to be willing to do that. So that's, those are great questions, but, and it is something that requires a little bit of a leap. Um, personally, because we are so used to keeping things close to our chest. So for the sake of time, I'm just gonna move forward, but we can talk a little bit more about these questions at the end of the talk as well. But I wanna discuss what open science looks like in action now, and, and some examples of different communities that have basically opened up research and had huge benefits from it. And the first and probably the most obvious that I can speak to is COVID-19 research. So obviously we, it's an unprecedented time, but we can think about how quickly vaccines were developed and treatments were focused on because everybody who was working on this shared everything. It was doing as much research as possible in a concentrated way, sharing data, sharing approaches. And because of it, what might have taken many, many more years potentially to create a vaccine, we had three developed in a very, very short time span. So we're seeing the benefits of, of open science within the concept of COVID because everybody, because of the urgency around this, released everything and opened up everything. And it created collaboration and synthesis in a way that really speeded up research in a way we would never see elsewhere. And then when it comes to the vaccine side of things, we almost had another example of closed research. And for a while we did, where the US was refusing to release the patents on the vaccine so that other countries can get access to them and create their own product to vaccinate their own populations. And so finally that wall broke down and the US waived the patents so that other people can gain access. And I just love this quote, because this is really what open research and open science is all about. It's an unparalleled triumph in science, but if only 20 or 30% of the world winds up benefiting, what is the point? And that's really what closed and open research is about. If only 30% of people can access the research, how much benefit is it really having in the long run anyways? Another example, and a great, wonderful Canadian example that is really the gold standard for an individual discipline and an individual institute making their research available at every stage is the Montreal Neuroscience Institute. So this group was incredibly frustrated with how slow neuroscience results transitioned into treatments. They felt like they were slogging away and applying for patents and grants, which actually hampered the way that they did research because it forced them into a box for receiving money to do so. So they agreed collectively over 600 faculty and staff members to stop pursuing patents for any of their discoveries. And they were committed to making all the research results, the data and the outputs freely available. And they have really served as an international gold standard for what open science can look like. And because of the work that they've done, the amount of discoveries and work that they've done has, has intensified and rapidly changed the way that people are working in neuroscience today. So it's just a, a really wonderful example of how open science can benefit in this way. And then finally, what we're also seeing is I mentioned before the idea of publication bias. So really journals are looking for the highest profile, potentially sexiest type of research you can possibly publish. And that's what they accept. But there's a really big transition in research now to publishing failed results or potential projects that may not have had as big of an impact because people spend years doing work that may have already been a failure to someone else. And this is a valuable contribution to science because somebody tried something and it didn't end up working out. But if we don't publish and share that information, people will never know that and may recreate the same experiments or use the same patients over again and waste their time when they need valuable treatments available. So the shift here is not only the idea of making things open, but it's also changing what we reward as being valuable. And if we can have this available, this is really, really important. Finally, Canada has also committed to a roadmap for open science um, by January, 2023, anything that's federally funded. So a publication data or any materials is going to be required to be open. So when you asked about the risks uh, before, one of the ideas here is that eventually, because it's going to be a requirement, the risk is going to be reduced because everyone is required to do the same thing. And because of that, it's going to change the way the landscape is done and how we reward open research efforts going forward. 
So where do we start? And I saw something in the chat. And I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Yes, exactly. Or more animals. That's, that's an exact, that's a perfect example of what we're talking about here. So when we think about starting with open science, I want you to think about if you're considering to follow open research at the beginning of the process, how can I share what I'm doing with others from the very beginning? Can I set myself and hold myself accountable for what I've set out to do? A lot of this is being transparent about what you're doing. And so that when it comes to the time that you're collecting your data, or you're analyzing it, you're not tweaking the numbers to get that super high result. You're focusing on what your research question is and what your hypothesis was. You want to ask yourself, are others going to be able to understand what I'm doing and what I've done? And will my work be accessible to everyone? So what I'm going to do is take us through the cycle and at every stage show you something that you can do to make your research more open. So when we look at the idea stage, open science and action, something that people are doing much more frequently now, is actually pre-register your project. So before you even start a project, you actually describe your research question and your study design before you begin the project and you release it online so other people can find it and see that you're working on it. This eliminates bias because it shows that you've indicated, here's what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it before you get your data. Because we don't want to see people manipulating data or changing the research question after the fact because of the fact that the data didn't answer the research question directly. It also establishes an initial stage of the reproducibility project. I, as a researcher, can search you for you and your project if it's pre-registered and see what you're doing and understand all the different steps that you're going to take. It allows other people to identify research that's being done so I don't duplicate efforts or I could find potential opportunity for collaboration or feedback. And that's really what the pre-registration process does. And again, to show you that I also do this, for that same project I was talking about, I provided a pre-registration on the Open Science Framework, which is a platform I'm going to talk a little bit about later, which described my entire research process from start to finish. You can notice here there's a description and a summary, the date that I registered it and created it, and then a link to the project files afterwards. So again, it's putting yourself out there, but it's also attracting interest on the work that you're doing and opening up your, your, yourself to feedback and comments on your research project more directly. If we move on to the methods section, this is where we would be sharing our methods or instruments when possible. And so again, when you're thinking about releasing your research, as you create different instruments or survey instruments, or, or maybe you have uh, interview questions or a code book that you're working through or a number of different reference texts, you want to be able to share those as those are being created. Again, it eliminates bias. It also gives other people the opportunity to take those research projects, credit you, or those research products, pardon me, credit you and then use them themselves. Again, it's another chance for feedback and it provides your, an opportunity for you to make your research very, very clear. Here's the instrument I'm using. Here's how I'm collecting my data. And here's what happens to that data afterwards. Again, this can all be part of that idea phase, that pre-registration. So when you're describing your research project, you can also say, oh, here are my instruments that I'm building, or here's the method I'm going to use to synthesize the information that's going to lead to my publication. There are some existing tools out there that are great if you want to, if you have a specific protocol or approach that you take to your research. One of those is protocols.io. First of all, it's a great place to see if a protocol already exists. You don't always want to reinvent the wheel. There may be something absolutely perfect for your research that you haven't thought about that may have been created by somebody else. So save yourself the time and look in places like this to see if it's available to you. You can also able to share your own research here. And so here we have an example of a protocol someone uploaded about re-entering labs post COVID-19 shutdown. So it's, it's a very discreet protocol that's been set up for a specific purpose, and it can be as broad or as narrow as you want on this site. But the value here is that you can look and explore all of the different types of protocols that might be available. Another thing is the use of standards. So again, talking about not reinventing the wheel, it's going to provide you with existing approaches for collecting data or approaching a certain project in a set standardized way. It's going to provide you with a trusted method for conducting research. Again, it avoids reinventing the wheel. It can also make your data, if you're working in a, in a tabular scientific format, more interoperable. So if you're collecting data in a certain standard and someone else is doing the same, 
if you want to collaborate later, you can actually pool your data much more easily because it's collected in the exact same way. And again, this allows the opportunity to increase collaboration there. From there, we move on to the actual data collection process. So this harkens back to the research data management talk I gave last Thursday. But you need to make sure that your data is understandable to others if you're planning to share it. It can be understood. It can actually be reused by others because they know how it was collected, what was done with it. And again, it's going to provide you with a complete picture of your project. This is where the data management plan really comes into play. So if you share your data management plan alongside the rest of your research, people know exactly how you set out to do what you've done. So whether it's how you collected your data, how you analyzed it, how you actually want it to be used, all of that is covered in the data management plan. And so by doing that work up front, you can easily make this available to people and they get a much better depiction of what your project's going to look like. The same comes with the idea of a data user guide. So a lot of people nowadays are creating user guides to their data that actually describes how the data should be used and how it should be analyzed and actually indicate the different outputs that might be available. So if someone was to take a data set, they would also have the user guide and they would say, okay, now I know exactly what I can do with this data and how, I, how it should be used. Sorry, I have a dog barking, so I'm going to close the window. <laughs> and then from there, we move on to analysis. But the analysis stage is really a data analysis plan. So in the results section or in the method section of a paper, we often have a description of, of how data is analyzed, the statistical method we may have used, or the approach of how we collated data together or different um, qualitative information. But really, uh, an analysis plan describes how you're going to analyze it. it. It eliminates the risk of people manipulating your data or you manipulating that data. It provides clear instructions for how you took the data from its raw form, whether that's text or numbers, transformed it into a figure or into table, for example. And it pre presents an opportunity for you to share the software you use, the code, the analysis, all of that information there. So really important is make it understandable. Describe, like think about what someone else would need to know. So what method did you use? How did you, what type of data are you analyzing specifically? Did you use in vivo to analyze qualitative data? Were you using R to do some quantitative synthesis? And what's the output? What was the final product? Was it a figure? Was it a table? And are those things connected? Because if I see a figure and I don't see the raw data, how do I know that what the figure was created actually resulted from the data? So these are just things you want to ask yourself in the process of this open research process. If you use certain types of code, if you're a coder, I'm not sure if anyone is here, but I always like to include this slide, is that if you're using R or Python, for example, if, if any of you have chops in that area, there are great tools that actually help you document what you've done as you write your code. So these are two particular pro uh, products, R Markdown and Jupyter, which are really great for doing so. But that's an entire another conversation in another class. And then finally, we get to the final stage, which is we've made everything available across the research process, which means people have a much better understanding of what I've done from the idea stage to analysis. And now I want to publish my data. So this is where you're sharing a final publication or a poster and all that underlying results. It's the full breadth of your research now, not just that publication. So the iceberg water has drained and we have the full picture of what that iceberg looks like. I also want to remind people, I brought this up around the data sharing phase of the research data management class, not everything can be open. So again, if you're working with indigenous populations or with other human um, subjects, for example, you need to make sure that you have consent to make information available before you do so. And you also need to make sure that they have a role in actually how data is being accessed and potentially being used. So these are things that are important to think about. And I highly recommend that you read the care principles for indigenous data governance that show you how information is shared in an indigenous context. So once you've come to that conclusion, you've decided you know what you can share and what you can't, it comes to the idea of open science in action. The journal article, you can share in an open access journal. For your data, you can share it in a public repository. And the methods or tools you use can go onto a website for protocols, 
or other types of software. If you want, and this is also becoming common, and some of you may be quite familiar with this now, is you can share a preprint of your publication. So again, taking that step before you get to the final stage of having a published result is you can share a draft of your publication online. There are different servers and different disciplines. So the link on the left provides all the different types of preprint servers that are available, whether you work in humanities or natural sciences or the health sciences. So I highly recommend you take a look at those. And then on the right, we have an example of a specific preprint. And so what this does again is allow you to expose your research before you get to that true peer review stage in the publication process and get feedback again. So it's a very, very cyclical process here. Something else that people don't consider, and I think we need to consider much more, is, is the concept of citizen science. So when we do research, it often stays within a vacuum of our academic lives and other academics in other institutions, and that's how we get respect. But in open science, it really encourages engagement with the public. So not only when you're creating a publication and sharing these results, which may be understandable to someone who is an expert in your field, we should also be considering how do we actually communicate our research to the public, to the people that are actually going to be affected by this research that I've done. And so there's some great standards in the link below about how to involve the public in research at different stages throughout the research process. And I highly encourage you to look through that as well. When you're planning to share your data, if you want to, I, I brought this up in the last class, but the Federated Research Data Repository is, is Canadian, is Canada's de facto repository for Canadian research data. So I encourage you to posit information there if you'd like to for your data. And then the other one, which I'm going to talk about in, in a lot more detail, is the open science framework. So you'll notice that when I was talking about my pre registration and my sharing, uh, I used something called the open science framework, which is an amazing tool that allows you to share all of your research at every stage of the process and make it open and make it discoverable and citable. So you can dictate how people use your data or use your research going forward. So let's talk a little bit about that and why the open science framework can be a great tool for you in order to make research more open and available. Because to me, it's one of the only one-stop shops that's going to make all of the type of content I've talked about today available in a single place. So when we think about the open science framework, what it allows you to do is register your work, organize your projects, manage the people you work with on your projects. There's version control, so if you update documents, it will keep track of all of that. It will connect to all the other tools that you use, and it's a great place to share your work. So when we think about, again, the idea stage of the research process and pre-registration, Open Science Framework allows you to do that. You can make all of this information available. It's time-stamped, so people can get access to it very, very easily. And again, it's going to improve the transparency of your research. You're also able to organize your projects. So as you're thinking about your methods and your data collection and your analysis, you can essentially group all of this different information into discrete elements in your project. So you can keep all your methods content together, all your results together, any of the analysis data. All of that can be grouped and organized in a way that allows you to control how your information is being organized and discovered. What's also nice is if you're working with a large group of people, you can decide who has access to each individual component. So not everyone needs to have access to all the results or the hypothesis, for example. So you can decide basically who gets access to what and how. This is great for leading your own research project, but if you're working in a lab in the summer or in the fall coming up, this is a great way to introduce open science to researchers uh, and to potentially your supervisors in this area. As I mentioned in the last slide, you can manage collaborators really, really well in the open science framework. So it allows you to assign different permission levels to who contributes to a project. Everyone needs to have an account with the open science framework, but accounts are entirely free to use. It's, it's openly available. And you can decide who actually gets to be a bibliographic contributor. So when you cite something in the open science framework, you can decide whether someone has had the full impact of receiving credit that way or to just receive administrative work instead. The other benefit to the open science framework is you can connect to, to well-known tools. So whether you're using Google Drive or Dropbox or 
you have Mendeley or Zotero where you organize all your references, that can actually plug directly into the Open Science Framework. So you can pull all the information from where it already lives into this tool. So it's a really wonderful way to integrate and have interoperability there on top of that. And then finally, it's really it, the, the purpose of the Open Science Framework is for you to share your work. So you actually receive a digital object identifier, which will timestamp your project in perpetuity as a permanent place where all your research product, products are available and accessible. You can also apply a license to your data. I'm not going to get too much into licenses today, but there are different licenses that actually allow you to dictate how other people use your data or your research. So you can say, I don't want anyone from a commercial entity to be able to take my work and do anything with it to make a profit. I could say it's only available for academic purposes or it's only available for public use, but non-commercial. So there's a lot of ways around risk that we were talking about earlier that you can help mediate that by ensuring that you dictate how your research is going to be used in the future. And then because of that, you can cite these projects in any format that you need. So that's the image you can see on, on the bottom right hand side there. So again, just to show you that I've been doing this myself, I pre-registered my project on the Open Science Framework as I mentioned before, and I've made every single aspect of my research available online from my raw data, which someone could take, and they could have redone the project as well, but they didn't. Instead, they gave me feedback or served as a collaborator on the project instead. But all of that is, is, is exposed and available for feedback, and you're welcome to take a look at it so you can see a specific example of what this looks like in action. And then when it came time to write the publication, all I had to say was all of my data and all of the underlying research product is available on the Open Science Framework, and that's now tied to the publication as well. So again, doing that full circle approach. So getting credit for this. Again, I, I don't want to say this is a trivial exercise and it's important that you receive credit. So every document that you put into something like the Open Science Framework, make sure your name is on it in the document itself. And because of that, people will have to cite and share that information. So Open Science Framework facilitates that by making sure that you get credit for all of the work that you're putting out and available into the world. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about the Open Science Framework, I've created a series of short modules that help to introduce you to the Open Science Framework, creating a project and uploading files. So you're welcome to use this link to explore the tool itself. It's about 20 minutes worth of video. And I highly encourage you, if you're thinking about Open Science, to use the Open Science Framework because it's just the easiest tool to use for this purpose. Okay. <clears throat> Before I wrap up, I want to pause again, and I want to see if there are any questions or comments about what I've just described. I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to take some more water. Can I put the link in the chat? I can. I will put the link in the chat at the end of the talk so that you can have access. I will be obviously sharing the slides as well, so you'll have access to everything. Okay. So to come full circle, we've talked about why open science can be valuable, why closed science is problematic, and how the purpose of open science is to make all of these different actions possible so people can access our research in a more available way. Open science is meant to be transparent across the process, but it's important to remember that it's ongoing. So as new things are created, we need to think about, okay, I just created a new document that probably is valuable to the context of, of what people are seeing online. So I need to make sure that it's understandable to people on that platform. So you're constantly reassessing and saying, okay, how do all these pieces fit together? And how is this going to remain understandable to others? And again, it seems like you're doing a lot of work for others, but by doing this, you're actually creating a really a mental thread of all the different work that you've done over the course of the project. I will say that since I started practicing open science, writing the public publication has never been easier because I've taken every step along the way and all of that work is already done. So for me, writing the paper has been the easiest part of this process since creating this. But I also want to encourage you to think about the fact that 
by practicing open science, this isn't just a one-way ticket, right? It's not just about you releasing your information. The more people who share their information and their research in this way also gives you access to new instruments, to other projects, to potential new collaboration opportunities, to new data, to new software. And the more people who share openly and the more we can get credit for doing that means that a huge amount of resources for you to pursue research is being opened up to you as you do so yourself. So it's really about reciprocal sharing, openness and collaboration. This is not a one way ticket. This is both ways for everybody to work collaboratively and to make the research process open as it should be. So I want you to think about considering the value of making your research openly available. Continually ask yourself whether your project would be understandable to someone who's unfamiliar with your work. So again, think about the public in this case. How can your data or information or your research be understandable to them? Open science practices, as I've mentioned, can improve the quality and transparency of the research. One of the things that I think I think about all the time is that by having to make my research open and forcing myself to do that makes me more accountable for the work that I'm doing. It makes sure that what I'm releasing is really, really good because someone else is going to see it and I'm terrified that they're going to say, oh, this is junk, I don't like this. So it actually makes my work better by thinking about accountability in that way. And again, it provides an opportunity for you to find more evidence and establish new collaborations. And I think if anything, as you progress through your research phase of your careers, to encourage your peers and other people you work with to consider open methods for conducting research and use this particular presentation and the idea and the examples I've shown of what that impact can look like in order to make sure that this changes as we go forward, because it's really people at your stage of research and of education that is going to make this change. It's not the, the researcher who's near the end of their career that's going to change this particular cycle. So just think about that as you start to do research and if you consider anything that makes it more open, it's better than keeping it closed. So all of these references are here and available for you to use if you'd like to use them. Um, I'm also, we'll be sharing the slides so you'll have access to videos and all the links I've included today. Um, and I'm happy to take questions at this time, and I will open up that document and share it in the chat so you can see my work that I've done. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much for being with us today, Kevin. I'm going to stop the recording, uh, as I usually do, and then the questions will be able to come in. Thanks so much. Oh.